start recording and continue with the lecture from where we were. So <clears throat> the answers are the answers are what we're talking about in the lecture. Um, answers are based on what we're doing. Everything's consistent with what we're we're talking about. Okay, so we finished off by talking about inductive effects on charges, and what we were sort of talking about is okay, both the the number of atoms, the identity of the atom. So for example, here, we've got a fluorine here, we have a chlorine, they're about the same distance, but the fluorine is a stronger acid than the chlorine. That makes sense because fluorine pulls harder than chlorine. And the distance to the atom all have effects on a city. All these things are inductive effects. And the, the way this is working is the atom is pulling electron density towards it through the bond. Uh, and we finished off by ranking these things. So in general, when you're trying to compare charges, the first thing you need to compare is which atoms are the charges on. And you need to consider resonance structures because I might have the charge on a carbon, but it can resonate to an oxygen. So it's really on an oxygen. Then you compare that by row and then by column. Then you need to consider if it's all on the same atom, which one has the better set of resonance structures. If all the resonance structures are very similar, then you're going into an induction argument. And oh, there we go. So what we've been talking about is Bronsted acids and Bronsted bases. So again, we're still talking about H plus. Now, the definition of acids and bases that is, is a lot more general is a Lewis acid and Lewis base definition. This is based on electron movement. And this is, this is sort of the highest grade of acid base. I'm gonna turn on my video. Um, the highest level of acid-base interactions. So a Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor. Is anything that can accept a pair of electrons. And we can call these things electrophiles because they are electron lovers. And a Lewis base is an electron pair donor. So it has a lone, which means it has a lone pair. And call these nucleophiles after nuclei lovers. We're gonna get a little bit into this, um, the precise definitions of these different terms because acids and electrophiles are different things. Acids are a certain subform of electrophiles. Just like bases are a special subform of nucleophiles. I think it's on my next slide. So Lewis acids and Lewis bases. Yeah, a Lewis acid is an electron lover, a Lewis base is a nucleus lover. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at some molecules that if I whack my screen hard enough, does something happen? Why isn't my pen working? This is interesting. I seem to be having technical difficulties, which is really absolutely no fun. I'm just gonna pro I'm just gonna zoom out of this software and see if it's something to do with my pen or something to do with PowerPoint, because it could be either. Isn't this fun? No, nope, it's definitely my pen. Okay, great. Um, shit. Oh, I think it's because I put my, I must have been fucking with it. And I think I put my battery in backwards. So let's see if this works. Sorry, I'm normally better at this. Maybe that battery's dead. Okay. Um, 
this up for work. Sorry, I'm just going to take a momentary break while I see if I have another pen lying around. If not, I am going to lecture by waving and gesticulating. No, I think I have them all at work, not at home. Okay. Well, I'll replace the battery for next class. But for this class, we are just going to... I am going to write on a piece of paper and hold it up to the camera because that is the level of technology that I'm going to be reserved to. And then I'll scan all these pit. Um, is there a way I can have a live camera feed of what I'm doing? So I'm trying to like solve this problem in real time. You know what? That's not going to work. Okay. Um, so we, <laughs> okay, I'm going to try text. Let's just draw some text. You see, I'm really ready for this. Nope, that's not what I want. Oh, okay. Well, that was interesting. It, uh, okay. So the kinds of things that are Bronsted lower lowery <laughs> acids that aren't, uh, or that aren't Bronsted Lowry acids, but that are Lewis acids, are um, things that aren't protons that can interact with the lone pair. And so what we have, there's a lot of metals, things like lithium, lithium plus, isn't a proton, but it can act interact with the lone pair. Uh, we're gonna see a few different silicon verse based things. And one we're gonna see a lot in this class, actually we've already seen it, is boron. So we've had boron with four fluorides. It was one of your draw the Lewis dot structure of this thing. And I'm just thinking ahead now, seeing how much I need to put, use my pen for the next part of the lecture. I think I'm okay. Uh, boron with um, four fluorides. Normally that boron only has three fluorides. So it's a neutral boron. It's got making three bonds. It's got six electrons. And so it can accept two more electrons like from F minus. And in that case, F minus is a Lewis base. It is an electron donor. It likes nucleuses. The nucleus it likes is the boron. And the boron is the Lewis acid. It likes electrons. And the electrons it wants is fluorine's juicy lone pair of electrons. And I'm going to go back to the slideshow from here because this is you know what, actually, considering what could be happening with all this online teaching, I'm going to take this, I'll take this. Um, so when we talk, so generally what we're going to talk about is we're going to define the difference between electrophile and acid and nucleophile and base. So generally when we talk about bond formation to protons, we're discussing acids and bases. And when we talk about bond formation to any other element, we talk about nucleophiles and electrophiles. This is just a convenience because we're going to talk about acid base reactions. We're going to talk about electrophile nucleophile reactions, and they're almost always in competition one with another. And just so we don't blow our minds, we can keep some nomenclature that makes sense. We're going to stick with this kind of working definition. Uh, we're going to use curl, curved arrows or curly arrows, and they show the flow of electrons from the electron pair to the nucleus. So they start somewhere and they have the pointy part of the arrow points to the nucleus. And we've already seen a bunch of examples of that. So we've talked about acids and bases, we've talked about pH and pKa, we've discussed uh, predicting the direction of equilibria, we discussed uh, the different things that affect charge stability. Um, you don't want me drawing with my mouse. I, I'd love to, but you really don't want me to do it. It's really bad. Um, and we've discussed the definitions of Lewis acids, bases, and nucleophiles and electrophiles. Fortunately, the next part, the next lecture I have queued up does not rely on me drawing a lot of stuff. So um, practice if you need it, and you probably do. I, I would go through this. This stuff's pretty important.
Um, and if we're doing problem solving, this is basically our periodic table. It's really all we care about. And actually most of the stuff I don't care about, I don't really care about the aluminum. Like if I, oops. See, now, now I am gonna use the pen because all I need to do is draw lines. I don't really care about aluminum. Uh, silicon's okay, silicon's good. Um, these guys are silly metals. All metals are silly. Um, who cares about anything over here? This is all just, these don't do chemistry. So like, this is really what we're worrying about in this class. And even then, you know, we're gonna, we're, these guys are gonna make cameo appearances, uh, silicon and phosphorus and boron. Uh, we're really gonna be worrying about these six elements plus hydrogen. So there's really seven elements in this class and that's about it. Everything else is just there to fill out the periodic table. Okay. Oops. So the next slides were uploaded, I don't know, a little while back, not too long back. And this is hopefully going to be a little bit more of a comfort zone for a lot of you. I think you'll have seen a lot of this stuff if this ever opens, there we go. Talking a bit about confirmation of um, alkanes and what an alkane is. Again, I'm just pulling up my chat window. Uh, ChemDraw is too slow for me to do in real time. I, I, I work fast in ChemDraw, but not fast enough. So um, we're gonna talk really briefly about some of the hydrocarbon properties and some things we should be aware of and how these arise from the intermolecular interactions. Um, we're gonna have a really brief overview of some chemistry of hydrocarbons. I don't really consider this an important thing. I just am gonna talk about it because they really don't do very much. And I wanna emphasize they don't do very much. Then the bulk of this, course, this lecture is gonna talk about the three-dimensional conformation of alkanes and um, how to work with cycloalkanes and predict the properties in stereoisomers and discuss the conformations of some cycloalkanes. So we've discussed alkanes. Uh, you guys have discussed these ad nauseum probably in high school. Um, and we touched on them briefly. They're hydrocarbons without any double bonds. So all they've got is carbon hydrogen bonds and carbon carbon bonds and they're really, really boring. They always have the molecular formula CnH2n plus two if they're not cyclic. If they're cyclic, it's CnH2n. They come from oil. That's basically where alkanes come from. They're like decomposed plant matter. So in, you know, they are organic. They are from nature. It's just, they've kind of been sequestered for a few millions of years. So we are eventually gonna run out of the cheap alkanes and it really pisses me off to have people burn them because I really wanna use them for chemistry instead of burning them in cars. But that, you know, we're still burning them a lot. And this has changed a lot. Like in the last 20 years, you can see that like oil and coal has really dropped off as energy sources. We're starting to really move into renewables. Uh, so I'm really, really hoping that there's still some of these left over in, in 50 years uh, so that I can keep doing chemistry. When we're talking about um, the polarity of alkanes, we, we touched on this with hexanes. It's completely non, they're non-polar. They're not miscible in water. You're never gonna get them into water. They, so what do they dissolve in? You know, other alkanes, uh, organic solvents that aren't polar. And this is why we, of course, it's because they are nonpolar and they lack strong intermolecular interactions that they have a low density. So things like water have a high density because the water molecules bind pretty tightly to one another. And so they like kind of crowding in around one another. Whereas the alkanes don't have that. All they've got are these London dispersion interactions. And so you don't quite get as dense a pocket of them. So this is why they float on water, which is both convenient and massively inconvenient. So the boiling points of alkanes uh, increase about 30 degrees Celsius for each additional uh, CH2 group that's in them. 
And this increase is because of increased surface area. So you're making it bigger. It's got more possible interactions because it's got more electrons floating around in that thing that can cause induced dipoles. And so you get increased van der Waals interactions. When you branch them, you decrease the boiling point. So for two alkanes of the same molecular weight, so the same number of carbon atoms total, a branched one has a lower boiling point than an unbranched one. And the reason is entirely surface area. The branched one, you can imagine that on an unbranched one, every one of these CH2s takes up space, provides space on surface. None of them are masking any of the other. Whereas on a branched one, some of the surface area that would arise from the CH3 here is masked by this or the CH, is masked by the CH3, is masked by this CH3. So you don't get the full effect of the surface area these guys could do because these they're kind of touching each other weird compared to a straight one. So there's less surface area. And so there's fewer interactions. And so you have fewer intramolecular interactions. And so you have a lower boiling point because they're less likely to bind together. Melting points are just weird. Um, we know why. Because alkanes with an even number of carbon pack better into a solid conformation. So they have a higher melting point. So just the way that you can arrange an even number of carbons when you're trying to stack them as a solid, there's fewer gaps than if you have an odd number of carbons. And I'm not going to pretend I fully understand why. Um, this, it's not my specialty. And branched alkanes often have a higher melting point because they're more globular. And so they tend to be, you tend to be able to stack the balls better. Like if you take a whole bunch of sticks, like a whole bunch of pens and I throw them into a box um, and then I measure the, like the total volume of the pens I threw in the box, I measure the space of air left over. That's gonna be bigger than if I had a whole bunch of balls. Uh, I don't have any balls right here, uh, but I got some peanuts. But if I took all my peanuts, so I got a, this was a mistake. These were super spicy peanuts that I bought in Detroit and they're like um, scorpion pepper or something. And I can eat one or two and then my mouth is on fire. Um, I thought, man, I, I love spicy food. Nothing's too spicy, but these are really too spicy. So if I took a whole box of, well, actually you can sort of see in this container of peanuts, there's not a lot of space in between the peanuts. Whereas if these were sticks, there'd be more space in between the sticks. So branched alkanes are more compact because more compact things fill space better. And so you have a higher melting point because you have more contacts amongst the entire system, not in between any two individual molecules, which is what controls the boiling point, but total kind of interactions are higher. So you get a higher melting point with branched alkanes. These are things that happen. Um, I will not be asking you questions about them because I don't care, frankly. There, well, okay, there might be some questions on, the assi on, on this first assignment um, that's upcoming, but there won't be any on the exam. So reactions of alkanes, they don't do much. Uh, you can burn them, which I wish people would stop doing. So you take an alkane, you take excess oxygen, you add some heat and you generate carbon dioxide and some water. The thing that is a lot more useful and I'm much more interested in is cracking them. So you get these long chain alkanes, you add some heat, you avoid the oxygen, that's the key difference. And you add hydrogen gas and a little bit of catalyst. And what happens is you start breaking carbon-carbon bonds. Add enough hydrogen gas and enough heat and you can break anything. And so you add, you add a hydrogen to each of these two carbons and you split the, the bond. And you make smaller alkanes. Okay, so I can make smaller alkanes, but they're still alkanes. Well, if I leave off the hydrogen gas and I just heat them with a catalyst, I can break them and I get some alkenes because there's no hydrogen to add. And if I break the bond, they, the electrons have to go somewhere and they make alkenes. Um, I really hate this slide. 
And the reason I hate this slide is because I'm not telling you why any of this happens. And so we're going to be spending most of the course talking about why this kind of stuff happens. So you're not responsible for these things because we're not talking about mechanism. We are going to come back to the mechanism of halogenation. This is the one useful thing as an organic chemist that alkanes do. And that's that if you add heat or light and you add halogens like chlorine or iodine or bromine, you can do ra um, what's called a radical uh, halogenation where we're basically making free radicals on the alkane and it's adding a halogen. So we can make interesting molecules, useful molecules. Uh, well, okay, chloromethane is not useful, but dichloromethane is one of the most important solvents. Every year, a whole bunch of people die because they put themselves in a really small room with dichloromethane because they're paint stripping or something and it's not ventilated and this stuff evaporates at like 30 degrees and then they basically suffocate because it puts you asleep and then you die. Uh, chloroform does the same thing. And, you know, I really like film noirs and like Tintin and in Tintin, everyone is always getting chloroformed. It seems to be like something that has to happen every book. And carbon tetrachloride is this beautifully symmetrical solvent that is uh, massively toxic and really bad for the environment and is illegal everywhere. And so we've got a few liters of it stashed away because there's nothing like it for doing some chemistry. You can still get it, but it's like, you know, it's a thousand dollars a liter kind of thing. So um, overall, I'm basically alkenes are boring. And what we're really gonna use them for is to start talking about conformation. So, We've been discussing Vesper, which is this valence shell electron model thing of talking about the angles that are involved in atoms. So really convenient. These numbers, you know, it's almost like it was made for the decimal system. The bond angle between two hydrogens and methane is 109.5. The bond length is 1.09, one which is like 1.09. So it's like same number. It's easy to remember. And we have different ways of representing these. This is how we're going to mostly draw them with the caveat that we will probably, hopefully I will always be drawing the, this back wedge the opposite way, going back into the plane. There was recently a Twitter fight about this um, because we have nothing better to do. Then sort of a 3D representation. This is what your darling model kit, if you bought a model kit, this is what it will make it look like. It's got a ball, it's got some other balls. And this is a more realistic representation of what this looks like, where we're looking at the basically the electron shells around these. And so you can sort of see like they, they're completely overlapped. And to me, these always look like space stations or something, or aliens, or slime molds, which look like aliens. So, the next, you know, one go one size bigger. Um, note this carbon hydrogen bond is now slightly longer. We're at 1.1 angstrom. The angle is 109.6. And that's because we got a carbon carbon bond here. And that's going to push these two carbons away from each other because carbons have more electrons than carbons and hydrogens, so they're repelled. And they're also second, they're two second row elements, so they have bigger electron shields around them. So you got to get a little bit further away. That's going to distort this carbon hydrogen bond because this this angle here is 109.6, which means the angle between any one of the two, any one of the hydrogens and any of the other hydrogens is going to be slightly smaller than 109.5. Who cares? It's 109.5. And really, I don't really, yes, these are quite different numbers actually, but whatever. I, well, I'm not going to be asking you bond lengths. It's not really relevant. Again, with your model kit, you're going to get something that looks like this. And with the space filling model, um, there are two carbons in here. So these front three hydrogens here belong to one carbon. This hydrogen, that hydrogen, the one that's hidden in behind the molecule belong to the other carbon. And it looks like a blob. And that's because molecules look like blobs. You don't have nice distinct atoms. You've got electron clouds around everything and they just look like blobs. I don't think of them like this. I always think of molecules like this. This is incorrect. They are not like this. They are like this. But I just, I have trouble reading this and making any sense of it. So I prefer to think that, you know, we have these nice discrete bonds of like, like columns between the different atoms. It's a convenience and it keeps me sane. So let's think about what the, so the first time we now actually have confirmation because 
this sigma bond between the two carbon atoms can rotate. Well, what do, it's because it's a cylinder. It, so what we're doing is we can have, if you build this, you can spin around those bonds as much as you like. And that's what actually is happening in reality. These things are rotating constantly. They're constantly spinning around. And at all times, you're never breaking the bond because this sp3, sp3 overlap stays the same. You're just rotating one of these. But you're not changing the area of the overlap. You're not changing the symmetry of the bond. It stays absolutely identical no matter how much you rotate this. So we're going to think about how to draw the conformations. So I'm going to just go back a slide. What we're going to do is, you know, if you have your model kit with you, and mine is in my office at work, and I will try and get it. I think I'll be doing my lecture from my office on Monday. Um, I'll try and get it out for Monday. But if you have your model at home, you can go get it. And if you don't have your model at home, you might want to actually kind of follow along with this later if you rewatch this lecture or just work through a written version of this. So if you're watching this not live, then pause it, go get your model kit. What we're going to do is we're going to look straight down. I mean, straight down this carbon-carbon bond. So I'm going to shift this angle so that I'm looking straight onto this carbon with that carbon directly behind it. And that's what this eye is telling me I'm doing. And so if I do that, what I see is the front carbon looks like a circle, little dot. Then there's this big circle, which is the electron cloud of the sigma bond which is circular if I'm looking at it from this angle, because I'm going to see that's thickest between the two carbons and kind of swells out towards that thick spot. So it looks like a circle. And then the back carbon is in behind it in red as a dot. The front carbon is going to have all three of these hydrogens propellered in front of me at about, they're 109.5 degrees from each other, but when I project them into two dimensions, they're 120 degrees from each other. And so this is what I see. When I'm looking down this thing, I see this top hydrogen is kind of, you know, it's the top hydrogen. This guy here is in my right hand. This guy here is in my left hand. And, that, and so when I go from looking at it to putting it directly, that's my right hand, that's my left hand, and I can do the same with the back carbon with the protons on there. And now I can sort of play spinny wheel with this thing and spin the back carbon around or the front carbon around. Um, I always spin the front carbon. This textbook is spinning. Yeah, I always spin the back carbon. This textbook spinning the front carbon. So there's different ways you could do this. You can have what's called the eclipsed conformation. And this is when all the hydrogens line up and everything. You can build this with your model. Let me take a look at that. And what you'll see is that there's no... Uh, angle between these two hydrogens. So if you just, you're, you're, they're overlapping each other. You can line them up so you directly only see the front one because the back one is hidden directly behind it. This is bad. It is not happy doing this because all, if we go back to the space filling model over here, what's going to be happening is note that this is doing this confirmation. It's called the staggered confirmation where they are not overlapped. One hydrogen is pointing straight up, one hydrogen is pointing straight down. We see that over here, one straight up, one straight down. If I line these all up, these two hydrogens are awfully close together if they were on the same side of the molecule. And you're gonna do this using Spartan, I think in your next lab. And you're gonna see that basically everything is trying to overlap when you eclipse them. They don't wanna be eclipsed. They want to be staggered. And what you can see here is like, okay, well, there's a ball here, and then there's a gap between the balls on the back carbon. And there's a ball here, and there's a gap between the balls on the front carbon. And these balls are the electron clouds, and electrons hate other electrons. They're self-hating electrons. So this is bad. The best possible confirmation is the staggered confirmation where all the hydrogens are 60 degrees from all the other hydrogens. Everything is a space as far away from everything else as is possible to be. That's great. Electrons like tons and tons of space. Um, so Noah asked what causes electrons to rotate. 
uh, molecules to rotate, and it's because it takes very little energy to rotate. And things, what we're talking about is probabilities here. And so if you froze it into this, this is the lowest energy confirmation. If you cool the alkane down to absolute zero, they are all going to be in this confirmation. But if there's any energy at all, if there's any temperature at all, it takes very, very, very little temperature to spin sigma bonds around. And so there's just some energy in the system. And if you only had, if everything was frozen in one confirmation, your entropy is zero because you have the most ordered possible state. And we all know that low entropy is not favorable. Things want to be random. And so if things are spinning around, they're sampling all sorts of different shapes. Yeah, basically one degree Kelvin, you'll start start starting to spin sigma bonds. So minus whatever that is, minus 300 and whatever. Minus 269 degrees Celsius and you're spinning sigma bonds. Pi bonds don't spin. We're gonna get to pi bonds. Pi bonds do not spin. You need a ton of energy because you need to break them. If staggers most favorable, why do they change confirmations? Because of entropy. Uh, you want to sample as many different confirmations as possible. And if things can be causing chaos and making things confusing, they want to. So maybe a better reason is if, if we froze them into the lowest energy confirmation, it would not make students' lives difficult. And nature's a bastard. And so they do um, flip between all sorts of different confirmations. Anything in between zero degrees and 60 degrees, we call a skew confirmation. It's not perfect. It's not the lowest possible. It's not the highest possible. So if we draw this, what we actually have is a sine wave of energy. So potential energy as a function of the dihedral angle. So at zero degrees, they're eclipsed. This is the worst possible confirmation. You have the highest potential energy. You don't want that. As the angle increases to 60 degrees, you hit your lowest possible potential energy. As your angle increases again to 120 degrees, you're staggered again, or sorry, eclipsed again, because now the different hydrogens overlap. So here we have the two blue hydrogens. Now this black one has gone to midpoint and now it's gone overlapping the other hydrogen and the blue hydrogens overlapping the red hydrogen. Of course, all these energies are the same because they're all hydrogens. Uh, nature doesn't know the difference between a blue hydrogen and a red hydrogen. Now we can go another 180 degrees. And you can go all the way around, you can go 360 degrees. Um, low potential energy because the electrons are far away from each other. So it's not, it's not like linear, you increase the angle, the potential energy increases. It's we are trying to maximize the distance that each electron is from every other electron. So the electrons on this carbon hydrogen bond are further away on average from the electrons on this carbon hydrogen bond and any other carbon hydrogen bond when its bond angle is 60 degrees. When it is zero degrees, they're awfully close and they do not like being close. This is good for 3k cal per mole. This is almost a hydrogen bond, like a, the OH bond that we were talking about were about 5k cal per mole. So these differences in confirmations are almost worth a high, making a hydrogen bond, which is actually pretty big. Yeah, they're always revolving. Stuff is always in motion. Molecules are always flipping around doing things. Everything is always turning and rotating. Uh, no, st staggered is the best. Staggered is the lowest energy. Eclipsed is the highest energy. Eclipsed is the worst. They are unhappy when they are eclipsed. They are happy when they are staggered. So this is a relatively small energy difference. And at room temperature, these, and you know, down to like minus 100 degrees Celsius, these things are constantly rotating. As you start getting colder than that, the rotations get slower. And it's because there's less energy because temperature is a measure of average energy. So we know we can get a little bit more complicated. So let's go with propane but it's not really more complicated. What you've swapped out a carbon for a hydrogen. So that looks different and it is. So again, I'm looking down this carbon carbon bond. 
but all eclipsed and all staggered confirmations are equivalent. So here I have an eclipsed confirmation, the hydrogen on the front carbon and the methyl group on the back carbon, the CHC on the back carbon are at zero degrees from each other. That's bad. And it's worse than a hydrogen with a hydrogen because a methyl group is bigger than a hydrogen. And that's why we've gone from 3 kcal per mole to 3.3 kcal per mole. Um, because it's not super bad energy, it kind of passes through the eclipse to get to the next staggered. The, the molecule spends most of its time in one of the staggered confirmations, but it's constantly switching between them. And it has to go through an eclipse confirmation to get to the next staggered one. And it doesn't take much energy to go from there. It's kind of like what you're asking me is why are there waves on the ocean? Why isn't the ocean flat? A flat ocean would be so much more stable than a wavy ocean. And there's waves in the ocean because of the Brownian motion and the movement of molecules in the air that are causing wind and in the water that is causing the water to move around. And it's kind of random noise. And would it be more stable for the universe to be completely flat? Yeah, it would. Uh, and you know, at the end of the universe, when the last sun goes out and there's not much energy left, everything will be in a frozen conformation because the temperatures will be so cold. But until that time, we are gonna have some movement, uh, which is good because we, we wouldn't be able to be alive without it. But the, so what, getting back to propane and away from existential threats, um, zero degrees is the same as 120 degrees. You have a methyl group eclipsing a hydrogen, you have a methyl group eclipsing a hydrogen, and then you got two sets of hydrogens eclipsing each other. So they're identical. And so you get exactly the same curve we just saw with that thing. Things get a little bit more exciting with, okay, well, depending on your definition of exciting, things get a bit more exciting with butane. Because now we've got two methyl groups. Okay. So because this idea comes from the 80s, it is totally eclipsed. And so we have the totally eclipsed confirmation where we have the two biggest groups eclipsing each other. The two methyl groups are eclipsing each other. We have this, what's, it's a staggered confirmation, but now we're gonna call it gauche. It's a type of staggered confirmation. Uh, and it's because it's not perfect. This is butane. And because it's not perfect, the two, the two methyl groups are still closer to each other than we'd like them to be, but everything's staggered. It's kind of like, that's a gauche move. It's a, it's a socially awkward kind of confirmation. We then have sort of a standard eclipse where, okay, we no longer have two methyl groups eclipsing each other. We now just have a hydrogen and a methyl group and a hydrogen and a methyl group. This is bad, but it's not as bad as having the two biggest things eclipsing each other. And then we have a different type of staggered confirmation called anti because the two biggest groups are across from each other. This is better than gauche because here the electrons around this methyl group, the electrons around this methyl group were a little bit close together. Now they're as far as we possibly can get them from one another. And that's happy. And that's the best we can do. Yeah, anti is always the best because the biggest, the electron clouds are as far away from each other as possible. And we can see this in what looks like a much more complicated potential energy diagram. Uh, gauche is always better than eclipsed. Eclipsed sucks. Totally eclipsed sucks more. Eclipsed always sucks. And we can see that. So totally eclipsed were five kilocals above the baseline. Instead of what we were talking about was three, when we were talking with uh, ethane, we're now five, and that's because those methyl groups are bigger. The gauche drops down a lot. It's really good. We got these two huge methyl groups away from each other. That's awesome. There's still a bit of energy relative to the lowest state. So what's really important is when we have these numbers, these are all relative. Everything is relative to something else. These numbers mean how much higher in energy are they than the anti-confirmation. This isn't like the overall energy of the molecule. That's like a really big number. So in the gauche confirmation, they're kind of close together. It's not ideal, but they're not eclipsed. Then we go to 
an eclipse, a standard eclipse confirmation, like with the not biggest things eclipsing, so not totally eclipsed, like not untotally eclipsed, not totally eclipsed, incompletely eclipsed, just eclipsed. It's again, we bump up the energy. We're about 3.6 K cal. And remember, we went in ethane, it was three. We had one CH33H interaction in propane, and we went up to 3.3. Now we have two CH3H interactions, we're at 3.6. So each of those, a CH3 to H interaction costs us about 0.3 kcal per mole, more than H to H. Then we drop down to anti at 180, which is great. The two methyl groups are as far away from each other as possible. We move another 60 degrees and oh look, we're back to eclipsed. These two things are the same. They're mirror images of each other. They have the same energy. You have all the same interactions. So they should have exactly the same energy. And oh look, they do. Same energy, same energy. We do another 60 degree rotation and we're back to the gauche confirmation, but on the other side. Yeah, both gauche and anti are staggered confirmations. They're both, they're kind of like different, they're two different staggered confirmations. And it's a way to differentiate them. Otherwise we just say they're both staggered, but they're different. Then we add, do one last 60 degree rotation. We do the full circle. We've come all the way around and now we're back in our totally eclipsed awful confirmation. And so with butane, we're rotating this carbon group around. You've got four different states. You've got totally eclipsed, gauche, eclipsed, and anti. So what's causing these energy difference is this idea called steric strain. What time is it? Almost time. So in the totally eclipsed conformation of butane, these basically these two carbon atoms are trying to basically put their hydrogens in the same spot. Like the electrons around this hydrogen, the electrons around this hydrogen are trying to basically occupy the same spot. And if we build the space filling model, you can almost sort of see that it's, it's by chance that these two things aren't literally banging into one another. And that would be bad. Whereas, in a stagger confirmation, which is actually what we have here in the zigzag confirmation, this is why we draw the zigzag when we draw these things out, is because it's always the staggered anti confirmation. Because um, look, this carbon, if I pick this carbon here and this carbon here, I'm looking at this bond, the anti confirmation would have if this carbon goes that way, this bond goes that way, this bond will go that way. Those are anti to each other. And that's why we draw the zigzag is because it puts them into the anti-confirmation, which is the lowest energy confirmation. And here, these hydrogens are all, it's still kind of crowded, but they're trying to do their best to minimize the crowding. This is the lowest energy confirmation, but of course this thing is always flipping back with different gauche confirmations. This, this is the, the minimum energy state but very few of the molecules are actually in this state. They all have several gauche conformations and every single one of those carbon-carbon bonds can have a gauche conformation. And I'm sure you can count the number of different conformations that are available to the system. It is probably the number of carbon atoms minus one to the four. So this would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven to the four. Seven to the four seems like a very big number. Uh, it would be 49 squared. I don't know what that is, but it's a big number. And that's just gauche and staggered. That doesn't include all the skew confirmations in between. Um, that gets complicated. Yeah, it is. Zig we draw a zigzag because it puts everything into the anti-confirmation. By definition, that is what the zigzag is doing. So yeah, uh, what drives steric strain is electron-electron repulsion. And what drives them making gauche confirmations is entropy. So electron-electron repulsion makes you pay a cost to bring these things close together. But at some point, they are going to come close together because the things are constantly moving because there's energy in the system. And if there's energy, things wiggle. Um, I, yeah, I don't know how better to put that. If there's energy, things wiggle. I think we're going to leave it there. I think we'll start talking about psychoalkanes next class, and especially when I have a working pen. So, yeah, I think that's where we got to for today. 
it was 10, the, so the practice Mobius, somebody says, was it 10 questions or 11? It was 10 questions with the drawing question worth two, like the question where you had to pick the things worth two. up to how far will the first real assignment cover. The first real assignment goes live next Thursday. Um, we'll cover Monday's lecture. We'll cover Monday's lecture because Monday's lecture is really closely related to today's lecture. I can't answer any questions about the assignment because the assignment is still going on. Those of you who've already completed the assignment, good job. Um, I, I know some people had trouble. I'm gonna stop recording. If I can figure out how to do that. There we go. No, okay, stop share. Leave. Okay, and now it's just me. And